Uh, good morning or, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from <clears throat> the world. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Coleman, or, or Mike. I usually go by Mike Coleman. Uh, and I'm happy here, and thank you for joining us. We're here in American Fork, Utah, just in Salt Lake City, just outside of the zone of totality. <laughs> I think we had 90% totality with lips. Um, and it's still a great thing to see. Um, I've worked at Fluke uh, Calibration for about 18, <clears throat> excuse me, about 18 years now, starting with Heart Scientific, where Heart Scientific became part of part of Fluke. And at that time, working in the primary temperature Cal Lab in multiple different roles, and I'm currently the corporate temperature biologist. So again, I'm happy to be here and. and uh, uh, we're, as Steve already mentioned, we're talking about fixed point solutions to properly so that their traceability stays intact. And also, we're, we're first talk about traceability as it applies to fixed point cells. And um, through, they're going to read some current industry practice for pulling the sources of error versus of uncertainty. Stated with fixed point cells. First, I'll introduce a bit of the background of what we're discussing. Talk about stability and the definition, how it applies to fixed point cells and current energy requirements for it. And then we'll spend the rest of the time um, talking about how to control sources of error like pressure error, material impurity, analyzation, um, or apparatus error. So, so I guess to introduce our topic here, we'll do a, a review um, some bad point cells. If you're joining us, probably already know this, but um, to review the importance that they have in, in temperature calibration is that they are used for disseminating temperature traceability to SPRTs. Dependent on chemical composition, as all chemical freeze, melt, or triple point temperatures, but they alone doesn't guarantee a particular realization temperature. And also a dis discussion going around about reading the Kelvin, moving the definition away from the triple water and attaching it to the definition of the Boltzmann, to understand that even with that happening, there will still be uh, primary centered instruments for disseminating temperature need to be used and so this top is still relevant. Here's fixed point cells. The traceability has been a little complicated or, or controversial to discuss. And so hope, we're hoping that with the material we have today we can clarify some of the misunderstandings or some of the controversial stated with them. And those point cells are considered intrinsic standards. And I argue with any intrinsic standard, there are still potential that can occur if you don't use them properly. So, so I'm spending the majority of our time on is how to how to and limit those errors. So, for those have been considered intrinsic standards as they are can't realizations uh, for, of or of Consistent and repeatable temperature, linked to a constant in nature through the, through their chemistry. Uh, but there are some controversy with fixed cells, or or some inconsistency as well. Like for example, probably one of the more um, examples is the triple point of water and the adjustment we had to make in the early 2000s to um, help read this error that was being seen throughout the world as different labs were building fixed cells. Triple for water cells, water that they obtained locally, and that the isotopic content of water varied enough that it was in some disagreement as um, worldwide key comparisons were ha happening. And so they made that everyone uh, building triple cells for use with the ITS 90 temperature scale 
would use small. Um, and a standard oceanographic water, I think, if I remember correctly. So, so we all use now. So it's it was be fun to pull this cartoon from from, from our heart, heart scientific website, and uh, where these two uh, scientists or metrologists are looking at their new triple point of water. Level. And when this cartoon was made, rocking water was put into the, the heart scientific. The triple water cells, as it was, you know, you, local water. But after a small initiative, then, then we get everyone else transitioned over to VSMO. So if you're using a cell from uh, the VSMO initiative, then there is a slight offset that you um, uh, because of the isotopic content of the water. Well, to that, there are other mistakes being made, and which we'll be reviewing. You know. Uh, the, the other larger sources of error. This, this V small issue was a is, you know, very small error that went for many years because it is so small, honestly, but it is real. And the other errors we'll be talking about are much more significant and can completely just uh, the purpose of using a fixed point if, if they want to for. We always just start with the beginning by was reviewing the definition for tribability and in the calculation industry or metrology, the best to go to for this definition is the VIM or the International Vocabulary of Measurement. And here in the VIM we have the definition for metrological traceability. And as you all expect, it means that a measure related to a reference through a, a documented unbroken chain of calibrations each contributing to the measurement uncertainty. So we have that out of the way. We can continue with how this applies to fixed point cells. What are the current point traceability requirements that we see in industry? Well, those of you who are either accredited 1025 or are looking to become accredited to 1725 someday, it's important to end that the accreditation bodies will require fixed uh, point cells that you use to be certified or, or calibrated. <clears throat> In addition to that, uh, there's a requirement um, of also performing a proficiency test on a fixed point system. And it's important to note the difference there. Uh, a fixed point cell being certified, the stat traceability of the fixed point cell, but the proficiency test uh, ensure that the entire system is working correctly, including the, the Measurement technique, apparatus, calculations, um, to make sure the laboratory agrees with uh, another established laboratory. Also, um, the, it's important to know where and find specific information for 17025 as applied to temperature standards. So, uh, MAPLAP technical guidance or NIST handbook 150. Dash two provides more specific requirements. It is important to keep in mind that this comes from folks at NIST who remind, reminded me that this was written in 2004 and they are working to update it. Um, not when it will be completed, but they recognize that some things in it are, are have changed. But, but, but it, it, in the current version as it stands, uh, this is where we, we that fixed point cells are required to um, be compared or go test to assess traceability. But in reality, um, NAVLA and A2LA, for example, both require um, fixed point cells themselves to be certified. So the A2LA R205 Section 6.3 requirement uh, for forensic standards, which means, which basically says that Interest standards are required to be um, uh, to required to perform direct comparison with NIST or with an accredited laboratory, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so even at standards like the Sisson or Quantum Hall Ohm or you know, other ones that direct, you know, directly realize the SI, they all need to go through some type of intercomparison process to make sure that they are being used correctly. And that they are incorrectly. 
those of you who are not use 17025, the other um, or the other uh, main quality systems that are used in the calibration industry in the U.S. and CSLI's G540 all have always required that all different standards are calibrated, and specifically for intrinsic standards, that they, they just like similarly as A2O, as the A2LA statement says, that they will require intercomparison programs to ensure that they are working correctly. And with the next version of 17025 uh, for 2017 coming out, um, the working group the, or the, the committee created version is a thing in standards by being a little more clear in 1025 text that they are required to be um, interpared. Uh, we get a lot of people asking us, well, what if I just use a fixed point shell as a check standard? Because fixed point shells are a very good um, index standard as they provide a very consistent, unchanging source of temperature. So our answer to that is if, if that is all you're using the fixed point shell for, if, for example, to monitor drift, PRT, then trade is not required as long in, in some and as long as you don't have waste, and like with the triple point of water resistance of the triple point of water for an SPRT, where you not only monitor the drift, but you also program newly measured RTPW eight out, so that when you do that, that the ability that, that measurement that you're performing will then go through the triple point of water cell. I didn't say that very well. Let me let me reiterate that. Um, Tribility is not required for fixed cells that are used for monitoring drift of instruments. But if you are monitoring drift of PRTs or PRTs and following the correct method, which up a new RTPW or reasons at the triple water to check the SPRT for drift, the more you program the new reasons at the triple point of water value into the readout. Pulling the triple point of water cell into your traceability for for those temperature measurements, and the reason what happens is because it's, it's important to understand that every temperature reading that a readout produces from an RT, the RTW value is a key component, a key value used to calculate temperatures for converting resistance to value, and it's done through. WT90 equation. So we, we saw it here, here that RTP is the denominator and is included in every temperature in that comes from a readout. So a TPW value comes from your triple point cell, as it should, and then that, that traceability scheme and run makes the traceability go through the triple point water cell. To summarize traceability, whether whether or not, well, let me back up. Sometimes people um, get up on the argument of whether or not a triple point of water or a fixed point cell is a, an intrinsic standard. And that's really not a, a, an important discussion here. Whether or not they're intrinsic standards, they, they, they need to be intercompared, as we've seen in the quality requirements that we reviewed. Um, and six standards have to go through a, a method of intercomparison to ensure that they, they are working correctly and that they are being used correctly. And to intercomparing uh, efficiency test is a method of verifying the entire system is working correctly. I already mentioned the, that the apparatus or you know the equipment that means the the melt and freeze and triple point of water points or the point the technique used by the laboratory, and then also calculations and other things that are all part of the measurement system. Used for uh, interim check standards don't read a traceability. However, if they are used for entering, uh, for example, the reasons of the triple point of water into or out, then they do need to be traceable.
more thing. Um, in my view, that uh, because because this this uh, has been an, an eye-opening thing to about with with a lot of our customers, the idea that the triple point of water bills had to be certified, um, and the people got really worried about it, saying, "Well, does that mean I need to send my triple point of water to NIST?" And uh, that's not it's not necessarily the case. Maybe this is where you will need the the best certainty available, and you may have to send it to NIST, but you can send it to, you know, for example, provide certification um, or intercomparison services for fixed point cells. But you can also do intercomparison yourself uh, for if you're using a mini triple point water cell to monitor industrial type PRT sensors. Then an comparison could be performed using a PRT, as you recognize that that you have to adjust the uncertainty. So it's appropriate that you can appropriately verify the trend of water cells working correctly with a calibrated SPRT, uh, which in many industrial PRT cases that's perfectly appropriate. <clears throat> It'll the uncertainty will basically be a wash, so to speak, because of other more dominant uncertainties. So I'm sure that, that the for secondary processes, uh, this doesn't mean you have to have a, a full-blown um, intercom. We'll talk more about that here in a in a few minutes. Okay. So I'm to review some what we can best practice. Or suggestions for controlling pressure errors due to material impurity and due to realization technique and apparatus. So, um, uh, first, with uh, talking about what the two types of pressure errors are related to fixed point cells. First of all, every fixed point cell uh, have a um, uh, uh, internal pressure value. If it's open or press adjustable cell like the one we're showing on the left it's not the best picture of, of a of a press adjustable cell but at any rate it adjusted to whatever the user wants it to be and the picture on the right shows a sealed cell where the cell is sealed off at a particular pressure uh, in any case it's important to know what the pressure is and, and correct for it <clears throat> then the other type of pressure that's found inside of fixed point cells is hydrostatic head pressure, and this has to do with the, the column of melted metal inside the cell. We'll just talk about this a little bit more. First, uh, we'll the ideal gas law. See how temperature and pressure are related. Pressure is on the left side of the equation. Temperature is on the right side of the equation. And the ideal gas law says that if the volume system number of uh, the amount of stuff you have inside the the system stays the same, or the the amount of fixed point, or sorry, the amount of pure metal, for example. Then, if uh, uh, up, then temperature goes up, or if temperature goes up, then pressure goes up, and vice. So, this again, we're opening hydrostatic pressure. The pressure differential inside the caused by the column of of liquid material. So as you're melting a zinc cell, for example, you will have a, a column of melting when a liquid in all of them, then you remember your chemistry days or your your uh, um, phase that this exerts a pressure at the bottom of the column. The weight of the liquid column the pressure differential you go go in the, the the column, and so pressure will be a little bit higher at the bottom of the cell, which is where the SPRT resides. And it's also important to keep in mind that the I-90 temperature for fixed point cells is assigned at the top of the liquid column. So, if, so as you measure down in the fixed point cell, it's important to to, to make correction for the depth at which your SPRT or PRT is measuring. And the ID text is very helpful with this. You can go to the BIPM website, and they have a nice table showing 
for all right. fixed point materials what the temperature change by meter is so that you can easily find out what the immersion depth is of fixed point cell and um, calculate the temperature offset. So it's hydrostatic pressure. The other one is internal pressure. And it's important to note that the ND definition uh, establishes fixed point temperature values at a pressure of one atmosphere. Um, and so using a fixed point built by Hart Scientific or by Fluke in the Utah, uh, those are sealed at around 0.8 atmosphere. So, so close to one atmosphere, but uh, uh, but we hold them at the at the per of atmospheric pressure here in in Utah because of the fact that we're working with glass and it's just the way the manufacturing process has to go in order to um, be able to seal the glass properly. some potential errors that can happen with these different types of fixed point cells. So with the cell, uh, of course, if, if there is no correction applied, then that will cause an error. Then if linked to this, if there is an incorrect correction applied, if the math is done wrong or the wrong value the material you're working with is know what the pressure is and that that's that can be kind of a that's a that's a tricky one with cells because you can't verify the pressure of one, uh, if one cell is sealed. And of course, if the pressure changes, so if, for example, this develops a leak or or, or, or it develops a leak, then the pressure will change. Now, the other issues that are probably even more important than the pressure offset, that if it all leaks, um, because uh, you know, if, if room air, ambient air gets inside the cell, then then it really starts messing things up. But but these are these are the sources of pressure related errors for sealed cells. If you're using a pressure controlled cell, which there aren't a lot of these being used in industry, they are used a lot at the NMI level. So it's, so NIST and NRE and different NMIs throughout the world. Pre pressure controlled cells get a little bit lower uncertainties. Um, but with these, we 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 have had experience with pressure being set incorrectly. Of, of gauge says it's one atmosphere, but someone realized that the valve wasn't open to connect gauge to the fixed point cell. So know what the pressure was inside the cell, or the pressure not monitored during realization. Potential pressure was set at one point that was forgotten about, and pressure changed because of a leak. Noted, and then there could just be mis in the pressure measurement system. The pressure gauge has a problem, or again, there's a bad valve, um, or you know, there are different problems that could happen. Triple or triple point cells. Sorry, I keep saying the triple point of water. Um, triple point cells are unique in that they they have a set internal pressure, even if it's um, made in Utah, they always set to the to the vapor pressure of that of the material, so mercury, triple point of water, and argon are are all sorry, and argon are all triple point points, and they are again at the vapor point for that material or the pressure um, for that material, and so you don't if it's a triple point, you don't have to worry about pressure corrections. Of course, cell. So, Open to atmosphere, it'll no longer be at the triple point, and that's a whole other issue. But um, so I think a little bit confusing because the last bullet I put here, is no internal pressure corrections are required. That's not a source of error. That I, I meant that be a statement of of how these cells work. You don't, you don't have to worry about an internal pressure correction for, for triple point cells. We and this is the, this is the first time, by the way, we presented this set of material, and, and to make sure we get through all the slides, we're moving through fairly quickly, and we anticipate that some of this we'll have to come back to, to and provide further explanation during our 15-minute Q&A sessions. So, so I it feels like or it seems like we're moving along a little too quickly. So we decided to. For, uh, some examples of potential 
um, for errors and what the temperature, what, what the size of the error would look like. So we have a, few, a couple of different scenarios. Um, the first one, a column called open to ambient pressure. This is a scenario where a fixed point cell is built in Utah and then used in California or somewhere at sea level. And the pressure changes into the cell because there's a leak. Now, again, I, I recognize that there are other things that will happen that potentially will, will could this error, but this is just an example of a pressure um, differential error. So the pressure the cell would, could potentially change from 84.6 kilopascals to 101.3 kilopascals. And so when we consider the, the material involved, we can see in millikelvin the estimate temperature differential. So it's a, so these are small numbers. Uh, one, the large change being that at a limb where there would be about a 1.2 milliK change due to the change in pressure. So these types of um, or errors could be very difficult to perceive with an RT, for example. Right, but that if your cell is open to atmosphere, things that will be happening that will probably have larger errors. And then we call it worst case ceiling pressure. I, I don't know if that's necessarily the worst case, but but let's, while the cell is being manufactured, saw the pressure was set incorrectly, so that uh, basically, well, I'll back up and explain how cells are sealed. The cell is manufactured and sealed. The the ceiling takes place while the cell is 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 near plateau temperature or on the plateau. So the pressure is established at the temp where the cell is being used at the at the melt or temperature. But if something goes wrong and the cell is accidentally sealed at room temperature and the cell and it's now sealed, imagine because after looking at the gas law, the pressure will go up significantly as the cell is heated up to its melt point. Well, this will potentially be a safety concern if cell has a lot of pressure inside. So that's why we're listing um, the articulated uh, inside the cell so you can see, um, super, for example, which is all the way up at 962 degrees C, the internal pressure would get up to possibly 21 kilopascals. And the corresponding temperature due to the pressure would be about 20 milliK. Um, so, of course, this is risk because we we work very hard at making sure this doesn't happen to our manufacturing process. And uh, um, so this is a worst case scenario, but potentially in an open cell as well. The pressure could be established while the cell at room temperature mistakenly, and then when it's ramped up to its melt temperature, is how much the temperature could change. Okay. In static pressure effect, we have an example here where we have a typical, you know, not all fixed point cells have an exactly a 20 centimeter depth. We just pick 20 centimeters to make the math a little more forward. Um, and this is, uh, keep in mind the this is depth from the top liquid column down to the midpoint of the sensor. It's, it's not down to the tip of the sensor, to the to the midpoint. And it can be difficult to know exactly what this tension is. So there's there, there will be some uncertainty as you estimate where the midpoint of the sensor is and what the height of the of the column is inside the cell. And for example, in our analyses, we estimate that we can estimate these parameters, again, the, the, the location of the midpoint of the sensor and the height of the column within about a five millimeter window have an uncertainty associated with that. Well, if you look at the 20 centimeter window, the temperature air offsets that, that would occur over, again, a 20 centimeter uh, differential. Again, uh, let's see, the, the largest one would be silver at about 1 milli K. And so you can see that, that if, if, uh, if off by a centimeter, for example, you would just divide this 
by t just how much one centimeter differential would cost. So a, it can be a small number, but when you measure gallium, for example, at minus 0.24 milli k, well, that's right in the ballpark of what the certainty of a gallium cell is. Uh, so so sounds very, very essential if you, you neglect to compensate or correct for hydrostatic head pressure, you could complete uh, ruin or disrupt the, the whole purpose of having a gallium fixed point cell or, or you know, have an error equal to the, the total uncertainty of the gas cell. Now we just shift our discussion to impurity. So a little minute about how material impurity uh, measured by the manufacturer in you know, the temperature. So the manufacturer, like like Fluke, for example, buy high purified material, six nines material, or 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 six nines meaning nine point four nines percent pure material, and the material is, is subjected to a a, um, a, a a purity or a chemical assay called DMS to buy the, the purity and what the impurities are. And I'll show you an example of this, that, of one that provides in one of their papers, um, in one of their documents here in the next slide. But, but at any rate, the manufacturer starts off with highly pure material, puts aside the fixed point cell. Impurities that are in the cell will typically cause a decrease in temperature. Not, not all impurities cause a decrease in temperature, but the majority do. That's what we typically see is a decrease in temperature due to impurity. So the higher the impurity value, the, the more temperature is decreased. In. And those who have melted ice, uh, salt, understand that, have actually been able to experiment with that principle. And when the manufacturer takes the impurity results, you can estimate what the impurity relates to temperature-wise by using Ralph's law of dilute solutions. So the equation here, and it has the change in temperature on the left side, and there are different ways of using it. You can either, uh, I'll do more of what I mean about this in a minute, but you can either, um, yeah, uh, you can delta T through a slope of the, the melt plateau or freeze plateau. You can take the, um, the fraction of impurity concentration, divide it by the first cryoscopic content of the fixed point material to calculate the delta T. And so I'll show you an example of this here in a minute. Uh, so, so the main two things to take from this are, are uh, using the fixed point material cause a decrease in temperature, and, but once the material is loaded into a fixed point cell, you can no longer do a a mass analysis on the material. Now you're subject to using other techniques to try to estimate what the impurity is. Just start off with highly pure material, and then hope or work through the manufacturing process doesn't do anything to change the the impurity. So an example of uh, of an impurity analysis done on on an in so for a lot of indium. This was done best, and we have the reference here on what what document this is rooted in. And you see a list of, of the different materials that were that were evaluated for content. And you go to the column and you see the the usual contributors like tin and full and oxygen. Then if you get to the bottom and you can you see indium and it's zero point nine 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 well I can't see how many nines there are but it wasn't six nines. And so this is indicating that indium is highly pure. And Braxton, sum of the impurity concentrations is listed. And then the first cryoscopic constant for indium is listed. So we apply those numbers to the equation we showed previously. And estimate that um, the certainty or the T of these, these is around 0 0.07 million. Okay, for this indium cell. So, so get an idea of how of how much impurity if the 
realization temperature. Like we said at the beginning, you can do work and do it, but it still doesn't guarantee a particular realization temperature because there's more involved than just the impurity. As well as made, then the only method of evaluating impurity is by intercomparing cell and then also doing plateau variations. And it's a very handy feature with fixed points that you can use the cell, calculate the slope of the plateau, and then use that to then reverse calculate back to what the, the level of impurity is. So we have an example here of a fixed cell that the plateau changed by about um, 0.21 milli K. And when we put that back to the right equation, we see that the calculated purity here is about 99.496%. That's the cell tested in, a, in our fluke lab. Uh, handbook 150 from NIST requires a yearly verification of a complete uh, phase equilibrium plateau. In other words, if you're using your fixed point cells for traceable measurements, then once you, you do a plateau test like this, you may verify that the plateau works as you expect it and that it's, that it, that it's long uh, to do the work that you, that you need to use it for. And also, you can kill the slope of the plateau to find out what delta T is, because this delta T value is should be in your uh, calibration certainty analysis. Um, you calculate the purity to continue to monitor see if the impurity changes over. But the but the main that you derive from doing this yearly is you calculate or sorry you don't calculate you measure delta T or plateau stability of the cell to make sure that nothing's changing and certainty analysis is intact. The other thing that the slope analysis does is it ensures that your apparatus, so the furnace or the bath that you're using, is working correctly. One of the items ensures it's working correctly. So that is controlling material impurity. Uh, first and foremost, take care of the fixed point cell. We have a picture here of a silver cell that someone touched with their bare fingers and didn't clean it off after they were after they touched it, and they caused the core to become etched and eventually turns white from the from the person's fingerprints, and eventually the core. The reason why it's turning white is because it's coming apart basically, and eventually it could cause a leak in this fixed point cell. Uh, use approved baths and furnace for maintaining the fixed point cells. And clean, and then monitor changes in purity through annual plateau tests. Okay. Uh, key for uh, it probably seems redundant, maybe, but it's, I just want to reiterate that another key tool for Verifying or controlling fixed point error is by getting the cell certified. So, especially with cyst cells, we don't know what the pressure is inside. We're pretty sure what it is because we we manufacture a lot of, or we manufacture them, we test them, and we see that the process works very consistently. But, but I talked about things can change. Um, but the only way to know for sure is to get the cell certified. And the cell is certified, all the necessary pressions are applied to make sure we're, we're carrying to this 90 assigned temperature. Uh, and a primary standard level fixed point certification, there are three separate plateaus tested for plateau consistency and plateau. And there are three intercomparisons performed on three separate plateaus to, to ensure that the cell is repeatable. And uh, we'll we'll repeatedly um, arrive at the same realization temperature as test is performed. We'll talk more here in a moment about what a heat flux test is. Environments for a reference level fixed point cell are dictated by the BIPM uh, International Metrology. Very level cell. I already 
touched on this a little bit at the beginning, where the requirements aren't quite as strict because, uh, let's say, secondary level process, the uncertainties are larger. We sell cells out of the same high purity material, but they're smaller and used in smaller apparatus like the furnace you see here. And because of that, uh, and also they're often used in a more simple option. For example, rather than a zinc cell, a mini zinc cell with a freeze plateau, it's used on a melt plateau because it's easier to do. So for all these reasons, the uncertainties go up. Well, that opens up the opportunity for more options for certifying the fixed point cell. And now potentially the cell could be certified or compared with a calibrated SPRT with good cells. In our laboratory, we, we have the benefit of having um, ref level fixed point cells available. So we suggest a, a simple intercomparison of our secondary fixed point cells with the, with the prime fixed point cells. But it's, it's a reduced. Um, for comparison, where we we compare with a single plateau uh, or or single inter comparison, we do a plateau test. As you can it's hard to see what's going on, but here on the left in this chart, we have the melt plateau. <clears throat> excuse me, of a of a zinc cell, and we have the the plateau limits as, uh, here shown in in the horizontal bar. Just this cell is performing well within our assigned for it. We, we do this work uh, typically once a year on our mini fixed point cells, so they are still working correctly. Uh, um, we're almost, uh, looks like I'm going to just a little bit, but we're almost done here. The uh, category of sources of error for a fixed point cell point is realization te technique. So this involves um, the melt and freeze or, re or maintenance technique, um, how the apparatus is used. Uh, for, for a good source on how to realize um, fixed point temperatures, we would uh, just like to refer folks to the NIST um, 265. Or you can also go to manufacturer's instructions, as this 1265 doesn't. A lot of detail just shows generally <clears throat> methods for for real different fixed points. Uh, when we talk about apparatus, we're talking about, about the tools that are used to to get the cell on plateau and to measure. So the furnace or the bath that the cell sits in, the the temperature probe that measures the temperature, the rope that measures the probe, and if if it applies, then any pressure control equipment for kind of the pressure inside the cell. Some common problems we see with uh, the heat sources is um, we need the heat source's job is to melt, freeze, and maintain plateaus for measurement without interfering with the melt or free temperature. So what can happen with the NIST to cause problems? Well, <clears throat> if the, if the uh, furnace is or the S is often temperature thing, then it can actually contribute direct temperature errors. For if the furnace is set too high, then it could eventually start contributing um, an, an error to the to the measurement inside the cell. The, the furnace is or that in a way that they will not be contributors to the temp, to temperature inside the cell, and there are some tests and techniques out there that you can do to, to verify what your furnace or bath is interfering with the fixed point. Um, sure. The apparatus, if set incorrectly, can also cause shortened plateaus or false plateaus. And then, of course, there was a scenario where it could actually break the cell, which is actually, uh, I wouldn't say it's a fairly common thing, but we do have a lot of folks who don't monitor the the enormity of their furnaces and, and they end up breaking cells. And I'll show you here an example of, of how, to, um, how the uniformity of the furnace. The other part of the apparatus that's not strictly touching fixed point cell but still is important because it's part of the major system is are things like the readout, the SPRT, and the wiring. Errors that cause that can be caused by this set of equipment are things like um, wrong excitation current, 
uh, connections or just general instability of uh, of these instruments. So some uh, methods that we recommend for verifying the apparatus are heat flux test, uniformity test, plateau test, and then using a control chart. So a flux test um, is a requirement um, also listed in NIST Handbook 150. Basically, the bottom three centimeters of a fixed point cell have to be mapped to um, show that you can properly follow the hydrostatic head at the depth in the fixed point cell changes. So what that tells us is, is if you can track this very, very minute uh, in temperature as it relates to depth in the fixed point cell, that the apparatus is working correctly, that, that, that the RT has sufficient immersion, and that the furnace is providing a sufficient uh, um, unit to not fear with these measurements. So this is a very complicated and tedious measurement. It, it, it I don't have to be done every year. It's it's uh, more, the intention here is that it's done when you set up your measurement system. So if, so if you're getting your first of fixed point cells, then then you would want to do this to verify that your setup is correct. And basically, the way it's done is you just you put your T in the fixed point cell, and then make as you lift it in, in one of your increments chart the results against the hydrostatic head effect curve or, or a line and ensure that you are following the hydrostatic head effect line like we see in this in this graph. The thing that we do routinely on our furnaces is check the uniformity of the furnaces and so we have an example here on a on a zinc main furnace. Like if this is not done you possibly break the cell because of, of a large temperature gradient. And that if you're using an aluminum cell, you should probably do this check every six months because furnace controllers may drift that control the zones that set up this uniformity. Then with the furnace set um, close to the melt point, but while the cell is still frozen, and you measure inside the cell, the, the, the gradient this side of it, you measure in... in um, 30 meter increments, starting at the bottom of the cell and moving upward to the lower until the is outside of the cell to, to the furnace is working correctly. And then I already mentioned the plateau test. Uh, this is related to apparatus because if if the furnace or the bath is set correctly or is not working correctly, then then it will affect the plateau. Either the plateau will will have different um, they uh, will have offset or the plateau will be shortened. Or you can also get a false plateau where you think that you're on plateau, but it's actually just the furnace, um, very, very stable and looking like it's a fixed point plateau. And the other errors we already talked about, the readout um, and the SPRT and wiring. But I uh, find that eventually when you're using point cells, there is math involved. And so there could be the, the usual math and data entry errors that can happen in any calibration process. So, uh, one more requirement from NIST Handbook 150 and from 17025 is control charts and using check standards to ensure that, that your fixed point cell is working correctly. So we have an example here of a cell control chart from, from our laboratory. And it's really handy because you can see a couple of points where we went outside the control lines and we know that that we reject any re work that was done using that fixed point cell because some, something went wrong. Um, and so, in any other calibration process, uh, control is very, very, very important to process consistency and alert the user when something goes wrong and the process goes out of control. Um, in a laboratory, we we are a check stand standard at the base plateau when we're making measurements and then at the end of the plateau when we're finished calibrating DUTs in the fixed point cell in, in a reference level fixed point process. In our secondary level fixed point process where we're using mini cells, um, 
weight of the check standard at the beginning of the of each plateau. So with that, um, we can get to our full slide in our in summary. Um, Indus quality standards require calibration or qualification of of all, all different standards, fixed point cells included. Fixed uncertainties can be very in comparison with a known reference. Even edited, we recommend that, that these guidelines be followed because they do represent current industry best practice. And if these guidelines are not followed, demonstrated some of the uh, uh, errors that can be that can happen. Some of them that are very difficult to by um, and fear with with the fixed point cells uncertainties. So I apologize for going over, but uh, like Steve said earlier, we're happy to stay. We'll stay beyond nine o'clock to to help answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thanks, Mike, for that great presentation. <clears throat> Are you muted? There we go. We're ready to take questions. I've already received a few. If you have any additional questions, please text those in now, and we'll start answering those. When Mike, Mike is. Uh, Deviation of these small paired with prior production of triple point order cells. You talked a little bit about that. Maybe you could comment on what was there. Okay. Uh, um, there, if you go to BM, if you're really interested in drilling down in this, um, there's a key comparison performed to to basically launch the the V small initiative, and it lists uh, results from triple point water cells that were built from different locations throughout the world and shows the uh, different uh, um, uh, documents or, or errors. And so if I remember correctly, the heart scientific cells involved in that were um, different from VSMO by about, if, it, if I remember correctly, it was 0 0.02 or 0 0.03 milli K, so very, very small numbers, you know, 20 microkelvin. So uh, significant, but yet, Probably not detectable by anyone except for these NMI folks who are doing doing that work. Okay. Our question is: Could you get traceability by intercomparing a working fixed point against a reference fixed point in your own lab? Yes. Um, so that's what we do in in our laboratory. We we have multiple fixed point processes. <clears throat> so we have a set of reference fixed point cells that have been certified by NIST. We interpair other uh, fixed point cells with, with, that, with those, so we, we don't um, also have to NIT or, or an NMI um, intercompare two two fixed point cells together. As long as one is in the path of trility, then you can transfer that traceability to the one that you're intercomparing it with. Um, next, Mike, is who is providing analysis of BSMO and what kind of isotopes affect the accuracy? And then, follow question, what about the pH of BSMO? Does it change with time? So, there's several questions there he's asking about. Some good questions there. Um, in addition to BSMO, there have been some studies showing that, that potentially, or I'd say potentially, has been very well ver verified now that the boron a lot of point of water cells are made out of borosilicate glass and these have shown that, that there is drift happening in those triple point cells because of boron leaching into the glass and into the water <clears throat> so there are recommendations to use quartz shell uh, water cells to to avoid that issue I haven't heard anything about uh, pitch changes. Uh, but I can look at and see if there have been any studies on that. And then, uh, as far as the isotopic content of VSMO, the uh, see list what the isotopic content is of the VSMO water that we have. And we when we get done by an independent uh, testing lab, typically a university will do that work for us. And then, if the customer has any more questions or wants to do the uh, have that analysis done by their laboratory of choice. They have methods of providing 
samples of this of the water that's used in the triple point cell the customer then take to their own laboratory and have their their own isotopic and done to verify what 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 water Okay, let's take our next question. That one, can we extend SPRT recalibration interval by measuring drift the with a mini triple point of cell? Theoretically, uh, yeah, absolutely you can. Uh, the concept is, is that you can uh, push to drift limit your SPRT and as, as long as it, it does not need the drift limit, then the, the indi that indicates that the SPRT is is uh, within its allowances and can continue to be used. Um, it the reason in theory is because uh, the, there are always um, the rule. It part of it depends how strictly uh, you how strict the the, the drill limit is. Uh, for example, if you are using an appropriately large drift limit. The SRT may stay within that limit for 10 years, but potentially the limit is so large that things can occur with the SPRT that are not detectable by by measuring the the triple point of water reasons. So so this works very nicely if if a a conservative and tight drift or when it, I say tight but a, a an appropriate drift limit is assigned to ensure the SPRT does not drift into some other level of operation where, where other additional errors are occurring. Um, so since we can talk, if you need information about that, I I, I, um, I can help you out with that. I have some a lot of analyses that we can look at to help with that question. Okay. Our next question is um, I think asking uh, to the entities are assessed individually and depend on the performance of the cells at the time of test. That, is that correct? Yeah, it's uh, it's like everything. It, that's a good point. The so when it was certified, um, and the uncertainties associated with that certification are at the time of test. And, um, so I didn't really talk about. Is that uh, if you have a cell certified, one challenge is with that is that sometimes the certification uncertainty itself is equal to or larger than the, the than the uncertainty of the fixed point cell, and so uh, so that can be a frustration for people sometimes. I I buy this really good fixed point cell with a certainty, but but when I have certified, the uncertainty now is a little bit larger. But that's just how it goes, and it, in, in I don't know part of the partiology, but but it is uh, those are the uncertainties at the time of test. Then then you also have to add in additional uncertainties that for as the cell is used over time and what you know, the other additional uncertainties that may occur, so, which we talked about in this presentation, but we didn't we didn't all of them. That would that would have to be different uh, for a different day, I suppose. What the uh, the uncertainties are uh, at fixed point cell. Our next question is, this tech standard for fixed point cells is based on repeatability of the ratio to triple point of water. Do you use a check standard with the triple point of water cell? Um, that's a question. One one uh, one advantage that the laboratories, we have more than one fixed point cell. Sorry, one, more than one triple point of water cell, but our control results from point of water cells, so we're in essence continually intercomparing them, so to speak. Um, and you um awesome. I I'd have to uh, um let me think about for a few minutes as I think about uh, I believe I sorry on this, but I think we actually do calculate W for that control chart. I'll, I'll have to look into that a little bit more. That's a very good question. Okay. Move on to the next question. The delta is calculated taking into account the duration of the plateau. 
So what is the duration? Because if we consider a long time, T can be bigger for impurity calculation. Okay. Um, that yeah, the subtlety there that that's uh, that, that your your question brings up a good point. And is the the delta T of a plateau is unrelated to the length of the plateau because, uh, for example, when we certify fixed point cells, we want to time so we melt the cell faster or freeze the cell faster than, than normally you would if you were using it to for tolerating SPRTs. Like, like for example, a zinc cell, uh, when we use it for PRT work, we can set up the furnace so that the plateau lasts for at least a week, um, upward two weeks, excuse me, a, a single melt plateau or freeze plateau. But when we're certifying a zinc cell, we set the furnace to a lower temperature so it freezes faster. Plant goes from um, two weeks down to 30 hours or 24 hours. Delta T value is still the same, so that's that's uh, uh, it's important to know that delta T is independent of of, of plot length. Um, I'll get the question one more time. Question because if we consider a long time. Okay, so. So what is the proper duration? The proper duration do with um, how much of the plateau you want to use because if, if you take the entire plateau length, T will get larger. So a lot of laboratories will set limits of we will only use the first 50% of the plateau so that delta T is smaller and they fully make sure that everything works so that, that that's achieved. Uh, the furnace set that appropriately so that, for example, if if I'm going to use for eight hours, then I want to make sure that my apparatus set up so the plateau lasts for at least 16 hours, so that I'm only using the first 50% of the plateau. Um, but but that's not the only way to do it. Some laboratories, uh, like the secondary cells, since they are smaller, we um, use up to 75% of the plateau. And that way, we don't have to worry so much about, about controlling the furnaces as tightly. Um, if we want eight hours of, of work, then we sure the plateau lasts for at least 12 hours, so that we're we have cushion that we're not right against the end of the plateau um, in our mini cells. So, so it all makes sense. It's that the, the, the complications of having a fixed point webinar <laughs> is there are, as you drill down further and further, it gets it, it's uh, a lot of technique and fast here. So, so good questions. The question, Mike, is do you have an application note that talks about extending the calibration interval? Do we have anything like that? No, I, well, there's an old one about taking care of how to take good care of an SPRT that may talk about that, but. We do need to produce one. It, uh, even the the mental concept of mating and updating RTPW isn't really in any of the ITS-90 literature or any of the NIST um, done. So we've had a lot of requests to write, you know, a little tech note or white paper on on doing things of monitoring TPW and um, establishing. Um, Cal intervals based on um, concepts. So, so we we owe it to we have it available as early as I'd, as I'd like it to be. I'll, I'll say that. Okay. The next thing is, is your documented anywhere on the certification that comes with a fixed point cell? So, a cell from Fluke. We what the the, the internal pressure is. Okay. The next question is about uh, just to realize fixed point uh, to the copper point. And uh, um, his concern here is with the Rojas initiative, the uh, sodium heat pot, so on the 
protein, use sodium heat pipe, and then that's uh, we, we we get a Rojas equivalent for, for that. He's wondering how do I realize a, a copper cell? Uh, that's a good point because I think we came out with that higher temperature heat pipe furnace. We stopped making freeze zone hotter furnace. Um, into that, there was discussion about bringing the furnace. Um, so we'll, have to, we'll have to get back to you on that one to see if that's that's available. I, I didn't realize that heat pipes were were to pick the Rojas initiative. Yeah, we we weren't able to find a, an equivalent for that. So fix on that right now. We're, we're continuing to try to fix that, but so far we we haven't been able to. Right. Uh, let's. Your next question is. I think to that one. Let me keep going down here. Oh, um, check the uncertainty for a heat source like a temperature bath. I'd, I would have provided a, a, um, a uniformity example for a bath, but it, it's it's similar. You you uh, uh, sell well, a couple of different methods. One. Um, you can measure the of the bath outside of the outside cell, so to speak. Uh, for, for, let me say that by nature of having a stirred liquid bath, the non-conformity issue is not as of much concern because because of fluid there. If we've ever checked the uniformity in a fixed point bath, like a Murray bath or a Galilean maintenance bath, the uniformity is is uh, is very very small compared to what we would see in a furnace. Um, but uh, but basically though, it, it would be a similar technique. You would, would you could eat it while the cell is frozen and inside the cell, or you, you could you can take it out of the the bath and measure the uniformity because the difference between those two scenarios is is very very small. In a furnace, you want to put a uh, like for example an equilibration block in the furnace, check the uniformity, and then take it out and then put the cell in, because those two scenarios are so completely different that you will you will have a very different uniformity profile. Important with the, in a furnace to follow the instructions that we have here, but in bath there's more flexibility because the the uniformity is just, is small, and probably a greater concern with the bath is making sure that the fluid level is is at, is at the right height because. Some after months of use, people forget about the fluid and the price sometimes when they open the bath and find out that the fluid had dropped a couple of inches and the cell is no longer completely submerged in the fluid and things like that. But uh, we'll, we could we could add uh, a uniformity chart for bringing the uniformity of bath. It's a good point. The next is... Can we use a quartz SPRT, a model 5683, coupled to a black stack to test many ink and many triple point watch cells for later comparison um, or indirectly calibrate industrial RTDs? That 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 would be uh, that's a, a, a good set for um, doing that. Uh, the certainties a system are larger than the fixed point cells, but but as long as again, again, like I mentioned earlier, with if industrial um, P's or RTDs, typically certainties are large enough that it, it's not going to matter much if you if you rate from the, the pub three millikelvin uncertainty for I think it's just zinc mini cells, potentially a six seven milli K uncertainty that would be. Re they have to adopt in order to view that you're intercomparing the cells with that measurement system that you have, the 5683 with a black stack. Um, I'm getting off the top of my head what what a 5083 and a black stack uncertainty would be. Maybe it's a little bit larger than six or seven milli k, but um, but if, but uh, can make some very careful measurements using linearity of the black stack to read uncertainty to help. Cut the pretty good uncertainty that's buying um, the fixed point cell is incorrectly. 
So good point. It's a good example of someone more of an industrial or secondary level process on 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 tool set that they can use for that work. Okay. Next question is we use triple point any triple point of cells. What would be the effect of the submersion versus the ambient temperature in that situation? Uh, that varies with uh, potentially with with the kind of the SPRT or the or the PRT that you're measuring in there. Um, the the large errors. Well, well I well, measuring core beef SPRTs and and some of the uh, secondary level PRTs like a, like a 5615 in the mini triple point of water. We um, any potential error due to lack of immersion or or the effect of ambient on the some of the pro are basically undetectable as we as we've compared between a size triple point cell and a mini triple point cell. There have been some small errors detected when when you start measuring a smaller diameter metal sheath SPRT in a mini cell versus a full size cell. But still um the, the differences were very, very small, like uh, less than a milli Kelvin. But I I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but I'd have if you have a scenario where you're measuring, like for example, a 5699 or a 162C in triple point of water, then so we've taken. And I just remember that when we took the data, it wasn't as concerning as we thought it possibly could have been. If that means we we were worried that there was a significant potential for an error, but but there wasn't, and there there was, but it was, but it was small. small. So so if that's certain and you're using those. One of those two models that I mentioned, and then we can help you out with that. And so, some question. Next question: What's the calibration interval to maintain traceability of fixed point cells? Uh, that's a good question. The the, um, the folks at the NavLab or A2LA level are in mind, they're, they're working this out. The, the Handbook 150. Have required intervals, um, but it was written in 2004, and uh, there's, uh, either, in my opinion, there aren't any, there aren't direct answers on on that. So, what we have done in our laboratory that that NavLab has accepted, and it possibly is a basis, I I don't know because um, at any rate. Uh, uh, I remember correctly, in book 150, the reification intervals are related to the levels of uncertainties that you are. Um, so the the, the intervals varied from three to seven years, if I remember correctly. I may be wrong with that, but it's it's it's. Um, with thick cells. It goes by quickly, and they 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 really. That's why we live. We really fixed point cells, and so um, what we do in our laboratory though is every two we intercompare our one standard fixed cell with our reference fixed point cell. So we signed a two year um, intercomparison schedule, but not resigning the fixed point cells. We we're, we're prepared to, if we see one failing an intercomparison, then we may then it into a recertification step. But so far we haven't had to do that. They've they, they don't drift. Well fixed point cells don't drift, but what we're far as they they haven't drifted. All right. The next thing Mike is uh Different than fixed point cells, but it, it still deals with temperature calibration. His question is: We're going to build out our lab for temperature calibration. We're planning to buy a Fluke 1586 A. That's the SuperDAC uh, temperature scanner with a 5626 PRT and a 99B dry well. So, it says, how could we do intermediate checks of source and readout with with that equipment? 
equipment. Uh, probably the most common equipment used for monitoring the readout in 5026 would be a, a mini point point aware cell. The levels of uncertainties that you're working with with that equipment, you'd potentially also use a second uh, 626 that would be maybe your gold standard or a, a, a standard that only gets used for working the equipment. It doesn't get used on a daily basis. Uh, but a, but a laboratory is doing that level of work. Again, we're using a triple point of water cell to monitor the, the drift of the, the, of, the 50, of the 5626. And it also opens up the opportunity that they could also update at the triple point of water to help um, Counteract any drift that that does occur with the 5626. That's why that would be my first choice. Okay. And Mike, is is it possible to realize a false plateau shield in intact fixed point levels? Yeah, the false plateau thing actually has more to do with the apparatus. Um, furnaces are basically point furnaces are basically big dry wells. Dry wells aren't known for superb stability, but when you consider that, that 9014 furnace, so this is the full-size fixed-point furnace, the block there weighs, I don't know, 80 pounds, 100 pounds. It's huge. So there's a lot of thermal mass in the block alone, and then, and then you put the fixed-point cell inside of a cell basket, and then put it down the furnace, down inside the block, and have all this thermal mass and very, very good temperature control. So it's very easy, even in a mini furnace, we, we see this happen. Something has gone wrong, and we think that we are setting the cell on a melt plateau, and we're measuring it, and it looks like a plateau because it's really stable. It rolls it transitions onto a plateau. It has that roll-off um, look that you see in a, as we monitor a, a melt plateau. But eventually, find out though that it's that it's not really on plateau. Something something's wrong. And and uh, so well, these furnaces are so stable that they are very good at simulating measurements inside a fixed point cell. It's are harder to it's it's harder to. Um, Freeze plateau because uh, we watch and bad because if you, if you haven't used point cells much, you may not know what I'm talking about. But but, um, but when you're realizing a freeze, there is an undercool that that you will. See. That's a that's an indicator that that you are when you see undercool and then the transition from undercool back up to the plateau temperature, an indication that you're on a real. real um, Plateau, but but you know, sometimes things go wrong with freeze plateaus as well, and uh, we misses the undercool, and, and so then you're, you're usually cool the foot down, and anyway, things can happen. So, um, but but uh, false plateaus though are it, it's whether it's a shield cell or an open cell, it, it has to do with um, the furnace or the bath correctly and or incorrectly, and then look like you're on the plateau. The one, one technique that just to add to that, that if you are worried that you have a false plateau, the recommended technique is that while the cell is still on plateau, let, let's say for example you're running a melt plateau and you're not entirely sure you're on a plateau, you can adjust the furnace by so increase the temperature by 0.5 degrees and watch the graph of the plateau. And if the plateau temperature doesn't change, it can be marching ahead over the next 20 or 30 minutes with no change, then you have a good that you're on a, on a plateau because now you're, you're remembering the, the actual plateau of cell. If it wasn't on a real plateau, if it was on a false plateau, if you had the furnace temperature by a half degree, you could fairly soon see the, the temperature that you're observing ink by by and a you know, maybe exactly a half degree, but, but something something good. So that 
anyway, that's a technique for detecting whether if you're on a false plateau. A standard, of course, is invaluable for that. That's another reason why we should, you should have a, a control of the check standard. That way, if uh, worst case scenario, you just put the check standard in, and it will tell you if you're on a good plateau or not. All right, our next question is, based on well depth when using a mini triple point of water cell, should I use an approximation of like 0 0.0099 degrees Celsius rather than 0.1 in reference temperature when setting the triple point of resistance for the PRT? Yeah, that's a good question. Yes, technically you should. Um, do you have to with the mini triple point of water cell? Well, it, when you consider the uncertainties involved, you probably don't have to, you know. So, for for example, I in our own factory where we use triple point of water cells, mini triple point of water cells, we just tell folks to use 0 0.01 degrees, and it we it we're fine. But but, but you're right, uh, technically there is a slight offset due to the hydrostatic head effect, and that should be taken into consideration. Um, definitely becomes more critical for a full size cell. Because of the uncertainties and also the the height or the you know the, the of the water column, but uh, good 